Heute haben wir nochmal ein richtig spannendes Unternehmen aus dem 10x DNA Portfolio. Äh, ja, es kommt aus Frankreich und deswegen werden wir jetzt gleich ins Englische wechseln. Dabei ist auch Richard. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Äh, und ja, äh, jetzt würde ich also sagen, erstmal thank you very much for visiting us here at the 10x DNA, Emmanuel. So maybe let's start off and give a little background about yourself and uh, your company. Yeah, I was born in the north of France and I um, joined uh, my um, uh, Carbios a year ago. Um, in, Carbios is located in Clermont-Ferrand and it's um, one of the most innovative biotech in, in France. And the purpose of Carbios is to give uh, uh, solutions to the pollution of plastics. So that's what we do in a biological way. Uh, and everything we do is based on enzyme development. So I will, I will explain a little bit more later on. Yeah, so before we dive deeper, so it's about recycling of PET, of plastic. So plastic, unfortunately, is a pretty great product because it has, uh, it, it's, it's very solid, it's, uh, it has a lot of great properties, but of course, as we all know, it's also a pollution today. So we need to recycle it, and that, that's, uh, that's quite important. And you, you have a, a very new way of doing this in a very efficient way, but Richard will dive into this uh, later. Yeah, so maybe maybe to get started, um, could you provide us like a like a brief overview of the PET market in general? Why is PET so popular? What is it typically used for? And yeah, and and who is um, basically the main consumers at the moment? Okay, so PET is one of the main plastics used in the world. We um, consume on the on the planet about 100 million tons of PET every year out of the 400 million tons of plastics. So it's about about 20 to 25% of the plastics. PET is mainly used in packaging uh, for food and in textile for uh, industrial textile and also half of our wardrobe, uh, the sportswear, apparels, um, clothes being used at the World are, are Cup. In, in, yeah, the one used in the World Cup, the, all the shirts of the national teams are in PET which is very commonly called polyester fibers. So PET is the same materials between your plastic bottles, your food trays, food boxes that you have in your fridge. Uh, cosmetics use a lot of PET in the in the all kind of cosmetic products. Pharmaceutical also use PET in the, in the packaging. So one third packaging, two third textile, very common plastic, mm -hmm. and still a growing plastic because PET is replacing some other plastics. But also it's growing in the textile industry uh, at a rate of about 6% every year. So the challenge, if I might jump in, because with Freigeist, we also look into alternatives, like uh, don't use plastic, but, but for, for, uh, for the packaging, use something else. And I can tell you, it's very, very challenging. So recycling is so important and critical because I believe it will be very hard to find uh, other materials that have kind of the, the same property. So recycling is a very important uh, component here. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, alternatives to plastics needs to be looked at very carefully. We said plastics could be biosourced, but to be honest, I mean, biosourced plastics are only two million tons out of 400 million tons. So it's maybe a small solution, but it won't solve the, the solution for the planet. Um, if you use glass in packaging, maybe it's great, but it's 23 times more CO2 emission to use glass and to use plastics. So the problem of plastics is not by itself the plastics. The problem mm -hmm. of plastics is the end of life. Only 10 to 15 percent of the plastics are recycled today, and it's far too low. We need to increase The, the percentage of plastics which would be recycled. Mm -hmm. So one last thing, because I believe that that's so important. Like when you look at at, at, a, at a footprint to our planet, it, it, it's CO2, water pollution and so on. And if you then look at the whole life cycle, uh, some, some things like glass, they look great in the beginning. But if you then look at the whole life cycle of the creation of the glass and, and then maybe recycling or whatever, it, it might also get, get, get worse. So Uh, that, that's quite important. When we look into what makes sense, it has to be end-to-end -end makes sense. That, that's Absolutely. super important. Absolutely. Yeah. End-to-end and with different cycles. If you use one product for one cycle, single-use products, and you have used a lot of materials and a lot of CO2 for only one use. If you are able to recycle 10, 20 times the same products, you need to look at the CO2 emission along the, across the life with the number of usage you do. So the circular life cycle start to be a notion that we need to develop is how much material you use and how many usage you will have on the same products during across its life. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that basically around about 100 million tons of PET is produced Today. every year. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, basically, I have two questions. First of all, why is it so popular? So why is PET compared to other plastics so great in terms of its characteristics? And the second question would be, how is it typically produced today? Okay, so uh, most of the PET today are produced petrosourced. So basically, uh, under 97% of the PET is produced based on two basic components. So you need to assemble two basic components, which is what Carbios is doing, by the way. We, uh, you, you come to uh, acid terephthalic, which is one of the petrol source product used in the PET. And the, the other one is monoethylene glycol. So that's the two basic chemical components that assemble together makes PET. Why is it so commonly used? Uh, first of all, because it, it used to be, and it's still one of the less expensive products in, in the plastic industry. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's easy to, pack to use in packaging, so you can give it different forms. Uh, you can add easily some colors. So it's very commonly used in the packaging industry and more and more used. It's replacing polystyrene contents or it's replacing other contents. Mm -hmm. And in the fiber industry, it's the basis of polyester fibers, which is very, very easy to uh, mix, to use in all kinds of sportswear, clothes, day-to-day -day clothes. Um, so it's a very common, common fiber in the textile industry. Okay, so basically the, basically the, the raw materials of PET are terephthalic acid and uh, ethylene glycol. And both of these typically stem from fossil sources. Um, During the production process, are there like large amounts of CO2 emitted or is it basically just the end of life uh, aspect that is problematic in terms of emissions and so on? That's, that's mainly the end of life because unfortunately the PET today in the current state is very little recycled. I mean only uh, 10% are recycled. Um, and, and most of the plastics will end up landfilled or incinerated, and that's where you have in, uh, CO2 emissions. So, mm -hmm. so in order to increase the rate of recycle, you need new technologies. Current recycling technology have limitation in the number of waste they can process. Actually, what you throw today, or, my, or what I throw today in my yellow bin in PET, will be uh, recycled in a rate of about. 22% of what you throw can be recycled okay. and 78% cannot be recycled. A lot of the food trays, food boxes you have in your fridge won't be recycled because they are multi-layer. Multi so they have PET and some other contents in it mm -hmm. to avoid food migration. Um, so multi-layers multi are not easily uh, recyclable by traditional recycling processes. Textile is not easily recyclable. I mean, mm -hmm. textile is currently not really recycled. Most of the textile is incinerated. I mean, it can be reused once. Uh, if you give away your, your jacket or whatever, it can be reused once. But generally after, it's ending its life in incineration or sometimes in the oceans. But um, that's, that's the worst case. So we need to find, like, it's what Cabios did, we need to find solutions which will increase the percentage of waste which could be recycled. Today at Carbios, we recycle 100% of the waste. So mm -hmm. whether it's a bottle of water, a bottle of shampoo, a cosmetic uh, element, or whether it's a, it's a T-shirt, we can recycle anything which is based on PET. Yeah. So when you look at the how it's called the yellow bag, is it also internationally called yellow bag? So you said today there's only 20... 22% of the PET waste are recyclable. But only 10 are actually recycled. So, uh, so what you throw in your bin, you, you, you think it's going to be recycled in your plastic that you throw in your bin, but most of it is not going to be recycled. What's easy, what's well recycled today are the bottles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bottles of PET, uh, because mechanical recycling can do that easily. So colored bottle or, or transparent bottles. But most of the food trays are not recycled. Mm -hmm. and, and then the and problem is that basically the, the, these, the, these PET parts contain like contaminants or, or other part, types of plastic, which makes it difficult to recycle. Is that the problem? That's, that's one of the main problems, mm -hmm. right? And also the textile have, have no solutions, mechanical, mechanical way of recycling textile. So, so when you add textile, food trays, and a few other products that are not easily recycled, you end up with 78% of the waste not being recyclable mm -hmm. today with the current technology. So that's where Carbios come in play. We, we want to add a value to the chain by recycling everything, not recycling only bottles. We yeah. want to recycle everything which is PET based. And I think it's, it's important to understand for our listeners that 
like even if if the waste the, the PET waste is not incinerated in the end if it ends up on a landfill it still will emit the CO2 at yeah. some point because it degrades and um, or even if it if it's like um, if it ends up in the ocean yeah. there will be CO2 emissions from that as well no you're absolutely plus microplastics which are ending up in the in the biodiversity so mm -hmm. so it's urgent we do something to recycle more plastics to collect and recycle more plastics Uh, because incineration and landfill are not the solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, which is important for me. Of, uh, th that's why you are very strong, and, and that's very, very important. But we also need to keep on R and D uh, other solutions. So we need to go both ways. Because in the end, it's, it's just such a such a big mess that, that we no. create. So recycling super important, but also the other track. So that in the end, hopefully in 10 years or something, we have a better. better no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's not only recycling it's the whole chain that needs to improve from collection of waste also, uh, yeah. sorting of waste uh, and and you have a lot of technology in those in those uh, parts but also um, um, the recycling capabilities which are today too limiting the the, the, the mechanical recycling it's nice it, it exists but it's not really circular way of recycling and it's too limiting in terms of number of percentage of waste that can be tackled so we need to increase that with solutions like Carbios. Mm -hmm. And now before we dive into the, the Carbios technology, could we maybe take a brief detour on the regulation aspect? Um, so I think in Europe, there is increasingly strict regulation coming up. Yes. At, at, and then that, that's also true for the US, for instance. Could you give us like an overview of what currently is being discussed in, in politics and um, where we're heading there? Yeah, the regulation goes for a less single-use plastics and more usage recycling of the mm -hmm. of the plastics. So by 2025 in Europe, all the countries will, will have to implement a regulation where all the plastic contents in packaging will need 25% of recycling content. So, so in 25, 25%? In 25, 25%. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are some discussions to go beyond that for the future, uh, for 2040 or 2035 to go up to 50%. Mm -hmm. So the regulation goes into more recycling usage, um, and it's more and more copied in the in in, in the by the U.S. or, or by China or by other uh, states, which are generally looking at Europe as creating the way, and then it's copied in other uh, in other countries. So we see the trend becoming worldwide. It's a good trend. So that's for packaging. Now for textile, there is not yet any obligation of reincorporation in the product. Uh, people are well, well aware of the plastic pollution, less aware of the textile pollution, but I think there is more and more the regulation is going to copy on textile what's happening on the plastics. I, I believe it's also a very important point because sometimes people ask me, hey, uh, for example, Germany, we're not polluting so much, China is so much more important. But when we start here in Germany or in Europe, um, it's very good because we develop the technology like Cabios and then we can expand it worldwide and that's this has an impact. So the, the stage and first uh, investing into the technology, enabling the technology through regulations, maybe only in Europe, but then it can be expanded worldwide. That's that's uh, quite important. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the vision of com company like Carbios is to become worldwide and to help every country to have a solution. So that solution, which will start in Europe, will, will expand in North America and in Asia. And then also you have a very big impact. Yes, yes. Okay, then let's move on to the um, recycling technology that, that Carbios is, is developing and employing. Um, maybe could you first give us a, like an, a general overview? How is PET typically recycled these days? So you mentioned only like about 10% is actually being recycled. And how is this typically done? So which, which different types of recycling are there? So currently, uh, almost all the PET recycle you find is what we call mechanically recycled. So basically, we collect bottles, uh, I mean, companies collect bottles, and then the, the PET is heated at a very high temperature, and you, you create a kind of resin and reuse in a new bottle. Mm -hmm. um, it has merit to exist, otherwise we would be at zero percentage of recycle. But but the problem of, of this technology is little by little, the plastics will, will lose its property. Mm -hmm. uh, it will lose its um, rigidity, it will lose its color, it's going to become darker and darker. So it's difficult to do transparent bottles several times. Mm -hmm. And there might be a little bit of uh, introduction of small impurity into plastics, mm -hmm. what we call non-intended substances, which will come over and over and over. So. 
it's still okay for the fuel recycling, but then after after two, three, four recycling, it's over. Okay. So, so today that's the technology which exists. So this is basically 100 percent of it's recycling almost of, almost 100 percent of what's recycled today. Mm -hmm. And you have the technology of what we call depolymerization. So I don't want to be too complex for your auditors, but depolymerization is basically we take the PET and we go back to basic components of the PET. The monomers. Which are the monomers. Mm -hmm. And we reassemble the monomers to do a PET, a virgin PET again. Mm -hmm. So in that way, you have two possibilities. One is a technology which used to exist in the 70s, but which was never developed because in the 70s, 80s, nobody wanted uh, recycled plastic is what we call the chemical recycling. So there are several v possibilities to, to do a chemical recycling, methanolysis or glycolysis, but whatever. I mean, what you do is you take a solvent mm -hmm. and you do a deconstruction of the PET. So you break down the polymers break, into monomers? Into monomers yeah. uh, and you do a new PET again. Mm -hmm. So you have a chemical way to do recycling and you have the Carbios way, which is a biological way. So instead of using a solvent, what Carbios is doing to do that is we use an enzyme. Enzyme is a basic element of the living bodies. I mean, we have enzyme in any uh, living bodies. In our human bodies, we have 30,000 types of enzymes to do everything. When we, when I raise my hand at some enzyme, I do some, I've, I've done something. So. Enzymes are in every living body, every animal, and every vegetal uh, have enzymes inside. So what Cabios has done is to find and, and optimize enzymes to, to do the depolymerization. So basically, it's like a scissors. Mm -hmm. we, cut the, we cut the PET in small pieces, and we go back to the monomers. Mm -hmm. um, so chemical or biological will be the two possible ways. Big advantage uh, of the biological way um, first of all, we don't need to use solvents, and there is always a bit of solvents staying in the nature when you use solvents. Mm -hmm. Second thing is we, we, we don't need to, too much energy. We work at between 60 to 70 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. to do the depolymerization, which doesn't need so much energy, while chemical products would need much more energy, generally over 200 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Uh, third big advantage is we go with, with a biological technology, we very easily eliminate any kind of residues in the plastic. So we have a very virgin plastic quality. So we go back to a virgin quality uh, with no substances inside the plastics. Mm -hmm. so and it can be done over and over again. That's over no and over, over again. again. Okay. So we could say it's infinite. Actually, it's not totally infinite because out of one ton of PET, today we are above 90 up to 95 percent of transformation so i mean I, it, it would be a lie to say that we do one it's infinite because to make it infinite we will need to be at 100 percent conversion yeah. but we are already close to 95 percent so 95 percent you can imagine that you do 20 cycles of recycling with the same material uh, and at always at, at a virgin quality mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a very flexible technology what we are doing because basically from a from a t-shirt, as we go back to the monomers, from a t-shirt in polyester, we, we can do a bottle of water, a transparent bottle of water, or a colored bottle of water. From a bottle, we can do a, a bottle of shampoo. From a bottle of shampoo, we can do a t-shirt. So it's extremely flexible. We, we can take any kind of PET waste, and we go back to the monomers, which are used by 97% of the plastics production in the world. So that's also the last big advantage of our technology compared to chemical. We produce the two monomers used by 97% of the plants, which are already installed. So all the plants of PET in the world, 97% of them use typhthalic acid, monoethylene glycol. Yeah. That's exactly what we so produce. So you basically tap into the existing infrastructure with exactly. your solution. We with don't your need solution. to scrap the industry. We are totally plug and play. Instead of uh, buying their PTA and MEG from PetroSource source, The PET producers will buy PET and MEG from Carbios. So, so that's a totally plug and play solutions, yeah. while uh, chemical solutions have to do polymerization on site. So they have to recreate the industry to be able to change the, change the game. So, and I don't think it's good to recreate industries because it's, it, it has some carbon impact when you mm -hmm. need to recreate totally an industry which has been created for 70 years. You absolutely. Know? And I mean, the, the PET industry is, is highly optimized. And, uh, It's absolutely highly yeah. optimized. Yeah. Okay. And so your technology is using enzymes. Where did the idea come from? So how did this develop? The founder of uh, Carbius in 2011 
had the idea that maybe enzyme could have an activity on plastics. Mm -hmm. So then they went very quickly to see one of the main doctors in France on, enzy on enzyme development, which is Dr. Marty, who is our scientific director, our chief scientist officer. And Dr. Marty even say now that at that time he did not believe that we could find enzyme that would have activity on plastics. But after a few years of research, heavy research, they finally found some enzyme who had activities on plastics. So it's a natural enzyme. Of course, we do bioengineer bio on the enzyme. So we have to improve the enzyme so that it, it, it can be really processed in an industrial way. But we, it, it's coming from the nature. So it's a, it's a vegetal enzyme that we have started from and that we have optimized to have activity on the plant. So basically, it, it's a plant-based uh, enzyme? Absolutely. And you extracted it and optimized it further? Yes. And, okay, to make it viable on, a, on an industrial scale? Absolutely. Okay. So in 2020... Uh, after all these 10 years of research, we published in Nature. Um, Nature is a very f yeah. famous scientific review. And, and we had, um, I think we were the first European biotech to be uh, on the cover page of Nature. So that really created some light on what Carbios is doing. Mm -hmm. Because the idea was really a revolution 10 years ago. And now it's possible. So that's really where okay. the revolution came. Nice. And I suppose another advantage of uh, the this enzymatic approach is that basically you can you can probably process different types of waste more easily right so if, if your waste is contaminated with other substances which can be a problem in chemical recycling um, i think the enzymes that you are using they are pretty specific on pet is, yeah, is that correct absolutely right i mean the enzyme is extremely selective mm -hmm. it will only work on pet so whatever and it leaves the other parts untouched it leaves the other part untouched and the other parts would be eliminated mm -hmm. how do you scale and what's holding you back to really make this big so we had um we have a demonstration plant up and running now in in the center of france and from that demonstration plant we are going to write what we call a process book, which is uh, how your technology works with some data. And that's the standing point to start licensing our technology. And, and the best way to scale quickly is to license the technology. I mean, we could dream, I could dream to do uh, five plants by myself, raising a lot of funds <laughs> to finance my own plants. But at the end of the day, that would be only 300, 500,000 tons out of the 80 million tons, which would be necessary in 2035. So if we really want to have an impact on the market, we need to have a lot of plants. And the best way Absolutely. to do that is to have licensing, to license our technology. So, so let us dive a little bit deeper into, into the current uh, plan that you have running. So what's the status? Uh, what are you processing? When do you believe you will be uh, finished and say, that's the run book now for other people to build uh, plants like this? So we, um, Carbios industrially started with a pilot plant in 2018. A pilot plant is a plant which is in a very large garage, but it's, it's a way to start yeah. processing. Yeah. Okay. And then we move, we decided to move from a pilot plant to a demonstration plant. And the difference is it's engineered in a way it, is, it can be scalable. So the demonstration plant is not commercial plant, but it's engineered by a team of engineers. We were helped by uh, companies like Technip and, uh, so to design the plant in a way it's going to be scalable mm -hmm. to large plant. So this demonstration plant is finished. Okay. We have started it in September 2021. We have finished it this summer 2022. And now we are doing batch of production so that we have enough data to collect so that we can write what we call a process book. A process book is the starting point of a licensing because you need that to go and see potential investors and say, my technology works it's unlocked, you can uh, be trusted because it's it's really proven in a demonstration plant. And the process book is going to be released the first quarter of 2023. So that's really the, the first part of starting the expansion of Carbius. Is that then the last plan from your side or do you also need uh, or want to build kind of a production plant or do you say that's from, from, from our company as we just built the, the, the technology and the book, you're then finished or do you also want to build the next plant? So we want to build one plant. Uh, we want to build one plant to help the scalability to grow very fast. So we have decided to do one plant in the northeast of France, mm -hmm. which would be the first one of Uh, of our technology, uh, but but we will we want only to build one yeah. because that's capex intensive, uh, and for a, a starting company like Carbios, it's a lot yeah. of investment. How much? Uh, it's 200 million euro. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but we need one plant. Why, why do we need one plant? Is um, when you want to uh, license 10, 20, 30 plants, you need a place where you train the people. You need a, pla a large uh, a working place where you can train the, the, the future people of the future plants. So, and, and what's the timeline for this? So the plant is now in the final engineering process and the permitting process. We will start construction in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, start ordering the machine and so on, and the and the startup is going to be in 2025. Mm -hmm. And I think this plant is going to be uh, in in partnership with Indorama, right? Uh, or yes, yes. Okay, and and so basically, could you tell us who Indorama is and uh, how this partnership uh, came about? So Indorama is one of the largest player in in PET. So they have uh, I think 19 plants in the world producing PET. So they do virgin PET. They are also invested in mechanical recycling, uh, and Indorama has understood that mechanical rec recycling is a, an important business for them, but it's not sufficient. We need to do something with the 78% waste that are not processable today. So, um, so we, they, are, they have audited and uh, do a due diligence on our technology. And they have one plant in the northeast of France. So we say, okay, um, when we looked at where to implement our first plant, We thought France was easy for our engineers to, vi to visit. It was also one of the French uh, government or orientation to say we want to support recycling uh, activities in, in, and develop that. So they, they have subsidized our first plant. Um, and uh, also the location of northeast of France is interesting from a waste collection standpoint. Because when you think recycling, you need to imagine that the waste is not too far. Uh, if you start to collect waste, which is 2,000, 3,000 kilometers all across the oceans, you have a, a, a CO2 impact, which is not good. So we need to go in demographies which are, which are sufficient. So in the northeast of France, at the border of Luxembourg, we can access to French waste, but also to Benelux waste and to German waste. So the waste collection can be done in a radius which is not too, too, too long, so that we have a better footprint, CO2 footprint. Mm -hmm. So how big is this plant? So it's basically the, the industrial scale plant. How big is this actually going to be? So the first plant is going to be 50,000 tons of waste mm -hmm. processed. That's about the equivalent of 2 billion bottles. 2 billion bottles. 2 billion bottles mm -hmm. or the equivalent of 300 million t-shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it's going to be a mix of t-shirts and bottles and, uh, and food trays. Yeah. But, but just to give you a reference. Um, and um, the idea is the output should be around but we expect more 45,000 tons mm -hmm. of monomers, which will become PET again. So mm -hmm. that's that's the idea of uh, okay. the current and, plant. And basically the idea is to m moving this from a demonstration plant to a, an industrial scale plant and just create the learnings along the way and refine the process further? So no, the, the process has been already refined in the demonstration mm -hmm. plant, but uh, the idea is to have a large plant which is operating To, uh, for several reasons. One, we have uh, some customers which are beyond Carbios technology and would start to become impatient to get some, some products in large quantities. Yeah. So like the partners we have, like L'Oréal, uh, Pepsi-Cola. Because they need the recycled plastic because they, they also from the consumer perspective say we are 10% recycled or whatever. Yeah, so they, they, they need, they need yeah. recycled plastics and they want to go beyond mechanical recycling. They want to have new technology like Carbios. So we've been in discussion with those brands for many years and they start to become impatient to have products. So that's why we do the first plant. The second reason, as I said, is once we uh, we will um, start licensing our technology and we expect to sign licenses mm -hmm. end of 2023, beginning of 2024, uh, when, when you start licensing the technology, you need to train the people of the future plant because, uh, I mean, to start up a plant, you need to have trained people. Yeah, yeah. So we need a place where we will train the people Cross on to an our engineering scale. Business, on an industrial scale. Yeah. So, so that, that first plant in France will also help training the future licenses. And we expect to have plants in the, in all the big countries in the world one day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so based on our research, we, we learned that basically in order to recycle one kilogram of PET, you need around about one gram of enzymes. Is that correct? So we need one for 1,000. So one for 1,000. One ton okay. of PET, one kilo of enzymes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now since we're talking like about a scale of uh, like 80 megatons uh, of, of PET, 
there will be lots of enzymes yes. needed. Yes. So where will you get these enzymes from and, and how easily is actually the enzyme yeah. production scalable? So Carbios is at the edge of developing enzymes, but we are not producer of enzymes. We can produce small quantity of enzyme if we need for our lab or if we need to test, but produce at very large scale enzyme is, uh, is a different aspect. So we have partnered with the largest producer of enzyme in the world, which is Novozymes. Mm -hmm. Novozyme is a Danish company. They, they have approximately 50% of the enzyme market in other sectors, uh, pharmaceutical, agriculture also. They are the largest producer. And it's important to partner with the largest one for us because when we will scale up, as you're right, the, the consumption of enzyme is going to be big. And, and the people investing in our technology want to have a kind of business continuity and security that they will be uh, supplied. So mm -hmm. not to the cost for the supply. And yeah. the cost for the supply. So partnering with the largest and most efficient company in the world producing enzyme was a smart move from Carbios. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so Novozymes will, will produce these on a, on a large scale with according um, like economies of scale and they, they can use all of their experience. Um, how will this work out in, in terms of the, like the, the, the business side? Will you basically purchase the enzymes from Novozymes and then sell them to your customers or will there be like a revenue sharing agreement or how, how will, will yeah, you organize Yeah, it's a revenue this? sharing agreement. I mean, Novozyme is, is, is taking our enzyme and is building large scale, is mm -hmm. taking our uh, an enzyme the formula, is a protein, basically. the formula, yeah. and we'll produce it large scale. We'll deliver it to our customers. We'll make the assistance in case there is any quality or questions. And we, uh, we get um, our profit sharing back so in the form of a royalty. So mm -hmm. that's the way it works. Okay. And, and because we own the IP on the enzyme, so that's our enzyme, but they produce it for us. Mm -hmm. um, now that you mentioned IP, how did you actually protect your um, IP? Is this actually important or how easily could this be replicated by, by com competitors? No, it's, it's extremely important. To, in biotech, mm -hmm. you need IP. And, and from the beginning, uh, Carbios has protected what, what we have found and, and done. So today we have uh, over 50 uh, family of patents mm -hmm. in the world. We are protecting in, in all the big markets our, our enzymes. And the beauty is whenever we improve an enzyme, we patent it again. So for instance, the one we publish in Nature in 2020 is not any longer the one we use in our demonstration plant. We have a better enzyme that uh, that is used today so we have reprotected the better enzyme mm -hmm. so as we keep improving our enzymes we keep having new patterns so but it's extremely important to protect not only the enzymes but also what we have invented in the process because uh, so all the optimizations and yeah so we have the enzyme ip and we have the um, technology ip so all of that is extremely important for for carbios to prepare the future We have three people full time at Carbios. It's a small company, you know, but we have three people full time on, on intellectual property, and we use big uh, agencies to help us. So very, very key for a startup like Carbios. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understood. Um, and now we already talked about costs, like both costs for waste and the enzymes and and so on. One of the big problems uh, of of recycled PET is still the price because it is still like. Uh, sold at a premium compared to virgin fossil-based uh, PET. Can you tell us about th this aspect? So what can we expect long-term? Will we see cost parity at some point? Or um, w w what is the price point today? If, if, I, if I now want to buy recycled PET from Carbios, how much more do I need to pay compared to fossil-based virgin PET? Yeah, so today fossil-based PET is the cheapest one mm -hmm. uh, because at the one... Uh, is used 90%, but people know they have to escape from fossil-based PET. So you find a ton of fossil-based PET around 1,500 uh, euro per ton. 1,500 euro per ton. The yeah. mechanically recycled PET cost is about um, 2,500 euro per ton. So it's a, there's a bit of variation month by month, but it's an average of 25. So like, a, like a 60% premium, roughly, yeah, to two-thirds? Yeah. On this. Recycled plastic with low circularity, but I would say it's, uh, and, and over that you, you will have some chemical recycling price with a pre another premium of 30%. And we believe the biological will be another 30% above that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be scared and telling me it's a lot of premium. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, in, in terms of price for the consumer, it's insignificant. 
um, you will have a few cents on the bottle of uh, cosmetic shampoo or cosmetic, a few cents added by our technology on the bottle. On a t-shirt, it's going to be five cents. So the, 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 the relative cost of that very circular and very clean technology is extremely low for the consumer base. So... Sorry, can you go again through the, the, the numbers? So we, we had this fossil that, that, uh, and then we had a 60% premium of the mechanical. Yes. And then what is the premium if you, if you run at full scale at, at Carbios? I didn't get this. So we believe the market acceptation would be 60% above the recycled, uh, current recycled mechanical, mechanical PET. And why is that? Why is that? Because you have 20 cycles of recycling with the same material. So you have circularity and you can claim circularity. And secondly, you have the quality of a virgin plastics. It's a recycled product, but with exactly the same quality, no impurity in the plastics than the virgin, than the virgin plastics. And last but not least, for the brands which are supporting Carbios, CO2 is extremely important, CO2 emission, life cycle analysis. And we, we bring to the table a lot of um, uh, LC advantages. So, All of that combined makes a premium for the for the packaging. So so um, the idea is that that whether through regulations or through what the the customers really want, that's why um, they will be ready to pay a premium, and it's a small impact. Yeah. Buy buy an expensive uh, shampoo that basically the shampoo I don't know could be quite expensive depending on the brand, uh, and then then the bottle is not a problem. But you would then not expect in the beginning that, for example. Um, cheap water producers would would use that that material because that has a slight impact on the on the price. Unless they want quality, if yeah, they are, yeah. if they are worried about um, potential substances in their water, they might use our product. But but you're right. I mean, we will most likely sell to more premium beverage, more premium uh, and cosmetic uh, industry or textile industry are the primary targets. The the, the low cost uh, beverage might be less. Uh, interested at the beginning, but they, are, they have the quality issues that they need to also consider. The quality is uh, what substances you put in your in your packaging compared to a, a, a Carbios product where there is uh, no substances. So, mm -hmm. but but once again, I mean there is a premium to that technology, but it's insignificant for the consumer. That's what we need to have in mind. It's going to be an impact in a few cents on the product but a value for a clean packaging and a, and a sustainable packaging, which is extremely important from a marketing standpoint. We did a survey on 6,000 consumers recently, and we just published the data uh, in France, Germany, UK, Italy, Japan, and US. And, and the feedback is consumers would be even ready to pay 10% of the price of the product more for a sustainable packaging. And we don't ask that. We will ask a few cents. So two, yeah. three, four cents. So, yeah, yeah. so that's, I mean, but it's to tell you that 50%, no, I, I, to be truth, 50% of the consumer would be ready to pay a 10% premium. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's going to cost the technology. It's going to be to cost a few cents. It's going to be invisible for the, for, for the consumer in terms of retail uh, mm -hmm. price. And on top of that, I think one of the reasons why fossil-based virgin PET is still so cheap is because the actual cost of the carbon emissions is not properly accounted for nowadays. You're absolutely right. And if and this is likely going to change, right? So over time, more uh, carbon taxes and other types of regulation will come in place. And this should probably like reduce this. That, premium, will, eh? that will reduce the gap. You're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the, the virgin PET producers, they have... Uh, Plants which are huge. I mean, they can do six, seven, eight hundred, one million ton of PET in the same site because it's petrol source. So you just need to bring the petrol to the place, and uh, they will produce a PET. When you're in recycling, you need to consider your footprint, your footprint impact. So if you start to say, okay, I'm going to build a half a million ton PET plant, well, you need to go so far to get the waste that at the end, of the, the advantage for the for the planet is not there so we need to imagine that we will be more local to local in the future mm -hmm. we will have reasonable size plants for demographies and the idea is to collect the waste locally to recycle the waste locally and to reproduce the pet locally so that's uh, the virtuous economy that we need to start to develop mm -hmm. and and if like in the future uh, carbon emissions would properly be like priced in, do you see price parity at some point? Or I, I do think so. First of all, of course, our process will continue to improve. So with time, 
we are going to gain in optimization of OPEX and CAPEX. So we believe that there will be uh, some cost down. Secondly, today we build a 50,000 ton plant, but we know that probably the right scale is a, is a bit larger. We could go to 100 million tons of uh, waste, uh, 100,000 tons of waste, not 100 million, 100,000 tons of waste plant, uh, which is a reasonable size of plant for demography, uh, like Frankfurt or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that could be the, the right scaling. And, and, and therefore we will have some cost optimizations coming on the, with time, with time. So mm -hmm. like any new industry, you have time to optimize and to decrease your cost, but you're absolutely right. Petro source product will go up because I think they would be uh, taxed on their carbon emission at mm -hmm. some stage. Okay. And now before we go like into the future for what the future will probably hold for, for Carbios, could we maybe take one step back and uh, talk again about the, uh, like environmental impact of your process. So you mentioned the lower temperatures, which means lower energy consumption. The enzymes are non-toxic. Uh, basically they, they're not like chemicals that need to be dis disposed of, um, in very special ways. So what is the, can you give us an idea for the environmental impact of your process at scale long term? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The enzyme are non dangerous product. It's proteins. It's a natural product. So we can transport it, manipulate it very easily with no protection. We don't need to be in Cevezo plants. Cevezo plants are the plants, the chemical plants all needs to be in Cevezo plants. Mm -hmm. We don't, we can build our high plants. safety standards high and everything. Standards. Yeah. We can build our plants pretty much anywhere where there is consumption and demography. So, mm -hmm. so that's a big advantage of our technology compared to chemical technology. And secondly, in terms of impact, today we measure our CO2 footprint compared to virgin plastics, which is end up in incinerated. And we had 46% lower CO2 emission. 46% lower, yeah. Than the virgin plastic incinerated. Mm -hmm. and, and we believe with time we will continue to optimize. But that's the impact on one cycle. And more and more we will have to calculate the, the circular impact of what we do. So if you use a plastic two times, okay, you have two, con two usage for one CO2 emission, for, for a certain given CO2 emission. Yeah. If you do 20 cycles, like we, we, we intend to do, we will have a, uh, an impact on 20 usage of the same product. So that's the circular like, uh, CO2 emission starts to become a, an idea that we want to promote. The circular life cycle analysis should become the standard in the, in the long term because looking only on one cycle, you can be misleaded. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the CO2 emissions that you currently produce, they mainly come from the energy consumed for your process? Yes. Which means if you switch to renewable sources long term? That's one thing we are looking, mm -hmm. um, is to look at uh, clean energy. Uh, for, and this for, could further reduce? It could further reduce our impact. So we look at several things. Distance to collect the waste. It's an important thing. So because it has an impact, uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm and be as close as possible to the PET producers. So we don't have too much transportation CO2 emissions in the, when we ship our monomers to them. So again, the future of this industry is going to be more local to local, mm -hmm. local waste for local recycling, for local reproduction of plastics. Local energy production. And local energy production. Solar, wind. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. the best way to get a, a CO2 impact. Mm -hmm. So when we look at, at Carvios, um You have a lot of great things going for you. Um, the, the regulation in Europe, so 25% needs to be uh, recycled, which I, which I, we all believe is a, is a, uh, is a great way. Um, I be believe the consumer just wants to have recycled plastic. So that, that, that's, um, they just want to use only these, these, these products. And then you have a um, superior technology. So what are your challenges? What's, kind of lets you you not sleep well or what are, what what are your challenges about why this might not become a, a worldwide success so it's it's mainly a question of scalability uh, i mean to really have an impact we need to license a significant amount of plants and be able to scale up um, so for carbios i think it would be a failure that carbios ends up in five years with or in 10 years from now with only five plants Uh, because we would impact, of course, we would have revenue and good profitability, but we will not impact the plastic, the plastic pollution. If we really want to impact and have a significant way, you need uh, to scale. we need to scale and we need to have our technology adopted in all European countries, in all North America states, 
uh, all the key demographies where there is PET consumptions and PET production. So that's really the idea of Carbius. What make me enthusiastic about that project is the idea to scale up and to have a, a real impact on the plastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and basically the, the key challenge will be to show that this will work on an industrial scale and then bring it to uh, other companies that, that uh, use this technology then. Yeah, and that, that's why we did um, a demonstration plant because that's already a, a way to prove the technology and to start licensing your technology. We don't want to wait the first plant in France to operate in 2025 to say we start licensing it. That would be too late. Yeah. So we want to start licensing our te technology based on this demonstration plant uh, where, where we have uh, already a lot of data that we can show to potential investors that this works and we have the, we have the results, we have the data so you can be confident in the technology. Okay. And now if, if everything goes according to plan and everything works out perfectly, how would Carbius look like in 2030? So 2030, we would still be uh, ramping up a lot, but mm -hmm. we would be accelerating the number of plants we, uh, we license every year. Uh, our target is to become the leader in the recycling PET world by 2035. Mm -hmm. So for PET, we want to be the leader. Again, 10 million tons recycled PET today out of the 100 million tons we produce, between 60 to 80 million tons in 2035. So there's a long way to go, but a huge market opportunity. Mm -hmm. So for Carbios, that's the idea to be the leader in, by 2035. And Carbios is not stopping to PET because we pick a lot of PET, but we, we currently do a lot of R&D on other polymers. Uh, you know, PET are only 20 to 25 percent of the plastics. Which types of like PP or PE or what so PP, PE, polyolefins are interesting. Uh, they are more difficult because uh, from an enzymatic standpoint, because they are more complex polymers. So uh, the CISOs, the enzyme, needs to complex. be bigger and different. So, but um, but we have other poly polymers which might be uh, more easily accessible, like polyamides. Mm -hmm. um, so we work on polyamides, we work on natural rubber, we, we work on polyolefin in our R&D, always with the same idea, enzymatic research. So we try to find enzymes, optimize them, and then have an, uh, have an impact on the plastic. Mm -hmm. So the future of Carbios is obviously PET is, a, is the next frontier and it's a huge market. But for, the, for Carbios, we don't want to stay there. My dream is one day Cabios will have a solution for any plastics. It's, it's, it's a bit far away, but that's the dream we have. I mean, uh, yeah. is to have an enzymatic solution, biological solution for any plastics we produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this would, be, would be fantastic, yeah. obviously. Um, and for us as investors, what should we look out for over the next one to two years? So what are the key milestones that, that you try to achieve now in the, in the coming months? So key milestone is obviously the process book. Uh, process book is really uh, my technology works. I have a manual, I have data about it, and, and I can demonstrate that the technology is robust. So that's quarter one uh, of 2023. And then obviously all the plan to be on time for ramping up our plant number one, which is important for our revenue. So we'll make announcements as, as, as soon as we progress mm -hmm. on, on this plant. Um, from a financing standpoint is the way we are going to finance this plant. So we have already made a, a capital increase in 2021 to finance a part of it. We expect the subsidies. So we have filed for the subsidies we have been promised, but now it needs to go to, uh, it needs to be approved by the French government. And now it needs to go to uh, Brussels. On the European level. Yeah. European level so that you get some feedbacks on that. So there will be good news in the, in the, in the, in the coming few months and few years, but, um, We keep, we keep working heavily, but we should never forget that the R&D is key. I mean, uh, Carbios has been an R&D company at the beginning, and the R&D is absolutely key. So we keep improving our enzyme. We keep uh, developing new enzymes. So there will be also on the R&D side some, some news to come. How big is your R&D team? So currently, we, have about, we are 100 people at Carbios, and about two-thirds are... RDI people, so whether pure uh, enzyme development or industrialization of process, process but it's about two thirds yeah. of the staff mm -hmm. is uh, RDI people. And, um, but we work also a lot in partnership. For instance, to do enzyme development, we need uh, the best academic scientist in, the, in, in Europe. So we are working 
in partnership to um, to do the, the enzyme development. So we do the, the key enzyme development work, but we outsource the part of the things. We use, for instance, nu nuclear res resonance, nu magnetic resonance to uh, optimize our enzymes. So we do that with um, CNRS in France. We use microfluidics to test the millions of enzymes at a glance. So, so we have technologies beyond our research that we do in partnership with academists. Big okay, <laughs> so yeah, and then maybe as as one of the last questions, um, are you confident or are you optimistic that the world will be able to achieve a full circularity at some point? And when will this will this be, in your opinion? Well, I don't think we have a choice. You know, I think we have to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think first of all, the the nine million tons of plastics ending up in the oceans every year is a disaster. So. So the question is not to say, okay, I'm going to collect the 9 million tons we throw every year and I'm going to recycle them. No, the question is to find ways to stop this. To prevent it from happening in the yeah, first exactly, place. Right? Yeah, exactly. Prevent it to happen. It. So it's great that some people take care of that, but I'm more concerned to make sure that plastic gets a value. Mm -hmm. And and to make the whole circularity happen, we need to give a value to waste which are not valued today. Yeah. We need to increase the collection of plastics. We need to stop incinerating or landfill our plastics. Plastic is, could be a great product, but we need to recycle the plastics. That's the only way to go. So, yeah, I'm confident that we will uh, maybe not be at 100% circularity, but that it's going to change dramatically in the coming 15 years. I'm, I'm very confident about that because I see really converging forces between the regulations, what the big brands are telling us, what the consumers are telling us. I think the, the society is ready for a, a better plastic. So there's a perfect storm yeah, coming perfect up storm. For, for PET recycling. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. So thank you very much for uh, visiting us today at 10X DNA. Um, we're uh, a happy investor. Uh, I believe it's a, it's a, a great mission. And uh, we're looking forward to the results. So you said there might be some, some good news uh, uh, coming up. So... Uh, Thanks again for visiting us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Manuel. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you.